Oh. This is all. Uh, uh, that sorry, voice I have to, always gets me. It's just like, oh yeah, sorry, yeah, I'm solid snake. Recording in process. Like, wait a room to move. <laughs> yeah, my other job. I'm solid snake. <laughs> um. So it's all Warrior Nun fans. It is. Well, um, it's so nice to see you all. We're, you know. Everybody who worked on that show is so proud of it, and we're all very, very close. and And um, and thank you so much for your support and all the amazing things that you've been doing, uh, fan wise. It's really, um, uh, it's really lovely, and and uh, means so much to me and Simon and Sheila and Suzanne and everybody. Well, um. I have two people who are going to stay and ask questions. And at the very end, everybody's going to jump on with their cameras. If you don't mind. Okay. No, that's great. All right. Thanks. Hey, hi, David. Um, Hello. I'm Ash. Hello, uh, nice Ash. to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. And I'm Kate. Nice to meet you. Hello, Kate. Thank you for having me. Yeah, Thanks thank for you for coming. Us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm actually I'm in Philadelphia uh, at a Comic Con, and I've been signing autographs all day. And I was like, "Why did I schedule this for today? I'm in, I'm exhausted." But <laughs> well, but thank I'm you still... for still joining. That's very nice. Yeah, yeah so no, we definitely appreciate the time, um, especially because you know this does not benefit you in any way. So we truly appreciate it. Well, it benefits me in that. Um, you know, even for a uh, an older white guy, uh, I put so much love into this show, and I really um, was so proud to work on a show that um, was so inclusive and was just about the badass women involved. and um, And I very rarely get to talk about it, so um, so it it re it's I get a lot out of this actually. That's fair. I yeah, um, I think that. Honestly, if it weren't for all each and every one of you who worked on the show, we would not have gotten the community that we did. So thank you again for being able to create something that resonated with so many. Um, and I'm glad to hear that it has benefited you as much because I don't think that we could ever like put into words how much this this story and this community has meant to all of us. Yeah, well, I, I see it. I see it happening online and just the amazing things that you guys are doing. And to have that response, you know, that's that's the main benefit for I mean, it's nice to be paid money. Everybody <laughs> likes money. But but the but the real the true benefit of this job to me is being able to write things that inspire people or or, or give people hope in places where they didn't have hope before or or feel accepted in places where they didn't feel accepted before and and that means more to me than than anything i i i just love it and and this show clearly had that impact and that that means everything to me that's awesome um hey do you want to start with the questions yeah. like you want to jump right into it yeah, um, I think I, I I know we're gonna do a little bit of an intro of just kind of like how we got involved with. Oh yeah, that's but a good. I idea. just briefly do that. Yeah. Um, for me, I guess I joined the fandom and like the fight to save the show because I really resonated with mm -hmm. um, some of the characters and their stories. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, like I had watched you know shows with queer representation before, but like personally, I was at a time in my life where I finally like worked through a lot of internalized shame that I had. And so I feel like I was fully able to like jump into the show. Like the timing just worked out really well. And so it was almost like a quite like a healing process for my inner, inner child to just be like, yep, I'm going to fully join the fandom and like fight to save this because I felt like I didn't have that like as good of representation um, when I was younger. So that's a little bit. Um, no, lovely. absolutely. I mean, yeah. same. no, I think that's very similar. I came into the show late i i started watching the show last july okay. um and i started i mean obviously season two hadn't come out yet but i watched season one and i came into it almost wary because i'd been misled with a lot of other um 
queer representation before, sure. you know, yeah. the whole barrier gays trope. And right. I was at a point in my life where I felt like I had watched, I mean, granted, I haven't seen, I started late, but I feel like in the last two years, I've consumed every bit of sapphic media that is mainstream um, and accessible. Mm -hmm. And I was getting to a point where I was worried about the future of like sapphic voices. And I mean, to some extent I still am, but this show really healed a lot of like fears and like uncertainties that I had about what our representation meant for us in the future. Um, And I think that you guys all did an incredible job of like capturing not only what it means to be sapphic, but also what it means to be human. And a lot of our own existential like questions that we face every day, um, you guys captured that so well. And the story just gave me so much hope. And it continues to, I mean, look at the incredible things that this fandom has been able to accomplish. Um, so yeah, I think that I definitely came here uncertain about what I was expecting. Um, and it just yeah, sure. blew me away. Well, good. I, I, look, I I don't even... Uh, we First of all, the, the writer's room, everybody involved were just the the nicest most accepting people and we were and there was a it was my first time writing um in a television writing room i mostly have written movies and things like that and so they they taught me a lot about um about the tropes that have been used and overused or or you know or just horrible and most of what it sounded to me like was bad writing or you know bury your gaze like what the fuck is that you know that's that's just nonsense and I don't, I mean, from my own perspective, obviously I'm, I'm not a gay woman. Uh, maybe I am on the inside, but, um, but I, I felt like it's, it wasn't even about a, a, a sapphic representation per se. It's just, these are nuns. It was all women. And I, we wanted to have love stories and it was just about treating everybody as human beings. And, and, and then when, Avatrice became the prime sort of shipping uh, object. It just felt right that that was something we would pursue. So, um, but uh, our executive at Netflix was uncomfortable with sex on any level, um, and didn't and was like, "No, no, 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 we're not, we're not going to do this Avatrice thing." And and Simon Barry and I were like, "Yeah, we are," and so. Uh, and the funny thing was when, so Sarah Walker, who directed the first two episodes of, of um, season two and a couple of episodes of season one, and she came in and she read the script and she said, oh, so, so we're not going to go with the Avatrice storyline? And we're like, no, we are. We just can't put it in the script. So every time you see her, she loves her like a friend, just understand that that's <laughs> the story we're telling. So we didn't tell Netflix what we were doing. Um, but we felt that that was the key relationship and that was what the audience wanted to see. So, and the key to it was treat them like human beings, you know, treat them like human beings in love. And, 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 and this idea that Beatrice is in the Catholic church, you know, and just so constrained still by, by, by these bizarre patriarchal rules, we were like, it's, the best storytelling opportunity is to just see Beatrice fall in love properly. And so that's, that's how it, that's how it no, came about. Think, yeah, yeah. So the, they were just gals, gals who were pals. That's how, <laughs> it, that's how it was written. And um, so like the big kiss at the, at the end was not in the script uh, until, until right before we shot it. And um, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm shocked right now. <laughs> Yeah, no, 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 you wouldn't believe, yes. you wouldn't believe how we, how we had to do it just because just the nonsense you get. And I'm like, who cares if they're women, if they're men, if like, if they're in love, they're in love. And that's, and this is what our I audience my, wants. I so, had my yeah. suspicions, but it is nice having you validate some of those like, um, 
those things that we've all been debating about. I mean, I feel like all of us had some suspicion that Netflix was a little. Um, I don't want to say I don't want to say Netflix itself. It was just a specific executive, executive. Um, and he didn't like he didn't like sex between men and women. He didn't he didn't like sex at all. He was just like very uncomfortable about everything. So I don't want to say it was the company that was telling us, but it was a representative of the company who was like, no, they're, I think his problem was they were nuns. So he didn't right. want there to be like a, a little... thing. And I'm like, yeah, but it's a love story. So shut up. Yeah. And now, <laughs> now, and now he's been fired. So it's okay. Oh, interesting. Um, that's, uh, I love all these behind the scenes, like snippets. I think yeah, you've just gotten was... a lot of information in like a couple minutes. I know, like you've completely changed. Like, <laughs> I know uh, you got. I see. I see you guys talking online, and it's like, it's like, well, you know, what a blow for sapphic representation. It's like, you know, a we're just writing a love story, and b we weren't going to let anybody stop us from doing it, and uh, and we made sure every time we were on set, and we also, you know, uh, Alba and Christina knew. You know, as soon as they came in, we were like, okay, this is what we're doing this season. And we're not really telling anybody. Um, but every time it says she looks at her friend, this is the relationship we're building. It's also why we brought in uh, Michael or Miguel. Oh, to whatever. like mislead, like. To make it look like, oh, there's this, he's the handsome guy of the of the yeah. uh, season. And we had so much fun because he really is pretty useless. And he just gets he's kicked just around. <laughs> You know, he just gets kicked around. The other key to this show is the women are always right. And the and the men are always kind of screwing things up, you know, <laughs> and even even the ones that mean well are kind of screwing things up. So um, so that was another mandate that we had uh, going through it. So I think that's a testament, though, of like, because really, I think that's what comes down to key rep. And I mean, I can't speak for everyone. I can only speak about my own experience, but when I go into representation, like when I, when I see a story that represents me, yeah. what I really, what it comes down to is I just want to be represented like a human being who deserves happiness. Of course. Of course. Um, and so I think that really is like, it doesn't have to be some grand declaration of like i am gay like um, i think when it comes down i mean again i can't speak for everybody because i know some people do crave that kind of representation but for me personally like all i wanted when i came to warrior nun was a story about two women authentically and organically falling in love together as human beings and i think that you guys portrayed that so well so Thank you. yeah, it's really I'm nice. I'm so to- glad. I'm so glad <laughs> that, that was that was the thing. And exactly like you say, not coming at it and saying, "Oh, this is an oppressed minority," or "This is a singled out uh, group," or or whatever. No, this is just it's just two friends who love each other, who are in these difficult situations, who find out that they really love each other. Mm-hmm. And isn't that how all of us want to be treated? And the idea that you would treat any group any differently is is so offensive to me and and hurtful so um so no i definitely yeah i appreciate that um any any other questions (laughs) or thoughts um so yeah we can jump into our q a i think um did you have some that are like warrior non specific and then some just about like your roles in general if that's okay whatever Um, you like sure yeah cool i can I'll go ahead and start. Um, Whatever you like, although I really love talking about Warrior Nun. I very rarely okay, okay, talk about it. And I'm so <laughs> proud of I'm so proud of what we did all, all collectively. I, I really I love the show. I loved everybody on it. And uh so but ask whatever you want, sure. Yeah, I think um well this could fit into Warrior Nun. Um, but so like you do a lot of things in the industry, right? From writing, producing, acting, directing. Um, and so we were just wondering. How, what are some of the, you know, the things that you enjoy about the different roles or some of the challenges that come with that? And I guess you could talk maybe a little bit about that in particular with Warrior Nun, since you sure. did producing and writing. Yeah. Um, uh, well, um, you know, every, all, all of those jobs that you mentioned are, are very different. And, um, uh, and I love them all. You know, being a voiceover actor is like the best job in the world. Uh, but it does not pay as well as television production or or, or feature screenwriting. So, um, 
but you know, but you know, it all comes down to um, I tell heroic stories, and I tell, and I, and I like to work on things where people are kept down. It's the same thing with the X Men films. These people, we got to do these films about bigotry um, because the X Men are these amazing, powerful people, but the world hates them and fears them, and we. It was such a great metaphor for for being gay for being oppressed for for facing racism or whatever and uh, and like i say my my i don't mean to be all pollyannish about it but my greatest hope is that people who don't have hope are able to watch these things and 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 realize they're not alone and and to realize to to quote adriel you are not alone <laughs> and um and uh and so yeah so uh, so that's sort of my my creative mandate is to ideally inspire people. And, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So then I, I don't know what else you want to know about the jobs. No, no, that's OK. Yeah. Ash, did you want to go? Writing to... writing is really annoying and uh, <laughs> difficult and, and brain melting. Directing is exhausting. I mean, absolutely oh, sure. exhausting on every level. Acting is really fun. On camera acting is is can be pretty boring. Um, yeah, better that than than real work, I think. <laughs> um, okay, so our second question, we already kind of um, dug into this a little bit, but I guess you already answered the first part, which is, were you aware when you signed on to the show that it would be so important for representation and that it would resonate so well with audiences? Um, and then the second part of that question is, were you aware of some of the parallels between this story and other sapphic stories that have been told? I, particularly in my head, when I watched Warrior Nun, all I could think about was Klexa from the 100. Um, because yeah, I sure. Like there are my, daughter, so many... my daughter watched the 100, so I'm, I'm familiar with it, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I feel like, I mean, it was a great show when it started. It did not end up well, but, you know. Um, that happens. Yeah, it happens. Um one of the things that stood out to me the most, though, is that I feel like Avatris almost became the story that Klexa deserved to to have, um, but wasn't mm. able to get at the time. Right. And there's so many parallels, not just between Klexa, but also other Sapphic. Rep I mean, I've seen people making parallels between Supercore, between um, Motherland Fort Salem, uh, between Klexa, between... Um, all these sapphic stories that have previously oh between Willow and Tara from Buffy, um, mm -hmm. Zena and Dan or Zena and Gabrielle from Zena. Um, so I feel like there's all of these parallels between all these previous sapphic stories and Avatris that it almost felt like a love letter to the past to being like, hey, we see what you guys we see the kind of representation that you guys have been treated to. And we acknowledge that you deserve better. Were you aware of that going into it, or was it something that just happened authentically? Uh, no, uh, going into it, no. Uh, it was just this weird comic book that we wanted that that Netflix was paying us to adapt. Um, uh, no, there was no intention of that. Really, what came about was. I mean, first of all, like I say, everybody was super progressive and everybody was like just really decent people um, who wanted to avoid bad tropes. Uh, like, for example, in the in the first season, uh, we hired um, uh, May Lifshitz, who's uh, who's trans and um, and never mentioned in the in the in the story that she was trans. Um, and she said, I've never done a part where they didn't bring it up or make a deal out of it. But we were like, why, why make a deal out of it? She's just, that's who she is. And, um, and yeah, there was no intention to that. It was just a matter of, it's the nature of the story. So, you know, first season we had you know, sort of standard things. She met this boy and, and she met JC and off they go. And, you know, it was really, but what it was about, the core idea was a girl who was, you know, quadriplegic, who'd never lived a life she had not been out of this room for like since she was seven years old suddenly gets the ability to walk and dance and have sex and uh, live her life and it's really a celebration of being a 19 year old who can finally live right and do all these things then 
Then the Catholic Church comes and says, no, you have to fight for the Catholic Church. And she's like, the Catholic Church, what are you talking about? And that was the basis of the show, right? I'm not going to fight for the Catholic Church. I'm going to hang out with my buddies and go to dance clubs and take ecstasy or, or whatever, you know, whatever it is young people do. And <laughs> uh, and then, but you know what, what happened was we started, we realized if it's nuns, somebody's got to be gay, um, you know, probably most of them uh, that's just the nature of what it is if if it's you know i mean i, I would assume a lot of nuns are gay because you're just you know you're you're choosing to live your life only with women sort of cloistered away and um and uh and so out of that we realized oh maybe you know maybe beatrice should be gay but trying to hide it um that that's why she joined the church to sort of escape who she was. And then I wrote, um, Simon doesn't like it when I say things I wrote, uh, but I'm going to anyways, because I'm very proud of it. Um, but I wrote, I wrote the sister Melanie scene, um, yes. w which, uh, which, which I had written as a, a scene to be shot, like a big action sequence that was going to take place in, uh, Nazi occupied France, and she was just going to blow out the whole thing. We were going to shoot the whole thing. Couldn't afford to do it. So they said, we can't afford to do it. So I said, okay, I'll rewrite it to be Beatrice reading the story to Ava. And then, um, and then I think it was Matt Bosack who wrote the line, don't hate what you are. What you are is beautiful. And it became such a, a beautiful, it was so different from what I had planned. I planned like you know, this, I had planned for her to be gay and, and to be killing Nazis because they're killing gay people. Um, but it became this really sad, lovely moment between Christina and uh, Alba. And that's, that's where it started. So, um, uh, so we just really, I think the difference is that we're not some dumbass network show that has to justify who's gay or who's not gay or or and if they have gay characters they have to treat them with kid gloves or they have to treat them like they're different we just let the relationships rise out of the story it was just the story and then when ava was looking at beatrice and realizing what she was going through it was so moving we couldn't not follow that storyline so that's how it happened no, I definitely like it was it was perfect. We actually have a question about that line. <laughs> um, yeah. Hey, did you want to uh, read that question? Yeah, let me see. Um, yeah, you kind of answered. We we're going to ask a little bit about like how that scene came about, just because I think it is probably one of the most pivotal or like impactful um, lines or like scenes in the show for a lot of people. Like when a lot of people are talking about seeing the representation on screen, that scene comes up all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess one of the questions was just, you know, when writing that scene or a scene that, you know, might have a really emotional impact, what is kind of the process you go through um, in writing that? Like, I guess you kind of, you kind of walked through how it wasn't supposed to be that way. It was supposed to be this action scene. Um, but were there any other scenes that kind of, you know, you know, ahead of time that they might have that emotional impact? And well, look, the, the key to good writing is it should always have an emotional impact. So you're, you're trying to find how the audience is going to be moved. Um, so by the time we got to, by the time we understood that we had to write the Melanie scene as a story, as a told story, rather than a filmed story we already knew that that beatrice was closeted and you know and very you know self-contained the way the way she is and then to have her be reading the story we knew you know the, in acting you always say what's the hottest choice so the hottest choice is this scene the story is very personal to beatrice and even her reading it is risky uh, for her emotionally and for her to be reading it to Ava is triply risky. Um, so all of that went into the presentation of, um, you know, or, or, or it went into the writing, the construction of the scene. Uh, and we were aware of that, but then, but then, you know, 
they need to get Christine Christina Tontieri Young, and she does it, and suddenly it's just heartbreaking and so beautiful and tragic and lovely, and and so uh, that's just how it came together. It came together the way a good story should. It just made sense, you know. And you shouldn't be thinking who's gay, who's straight, who's what. I mean, look, if you're gay and you love sapphic rep representation, great. Then you you know you seek that out. But as a writer, you should just be writing people, you know, and, and making stories that make sense. So that's my feeling. All right, I got a snuffly nose. <laughs> no, you're good. I've been sick for the last week, so I feel that. <laughs> um, no, I definitely, I mean, again, just I think that's something that I, I personally look for in representation. All of my favorite stories, yes, they've had hardships. Sometimes the hardships are because they're gay. But most of the time, the story overall is just a story about the humanity of these people. Um, and it happens organically. Like, whatever love story happens, happens organically and authentically. And it's not something that's like, I'm gay. So, like, I mean, it doesn't have to be this whole weird thing, you know, Um but the only again, thing that should be weird about a gay couple is the is the forces of the outside that are pressuring them. You exactly. Know? Like the fact is Beatrice can't be can't acknowledge who she is because she's part of the Catholic Church. She's because she came from a patriarchal family. Um, those are the things as far as I'm concerned in my storytelling. Those are the things that are wrong. Those are the things that need to be challenged. And. Uh, who you love is not should be treated as nothing other than the most natural of human emotions you know yes exactly um and all of my favorite stories I think have that layer um so I think that you guys again did an incredible job I've endless well, praise. again it's a it's a team I mean it was it was just all everybody everybody fell in love with these characters and and you know look you know uh Camilla's straight and yeah, hey, let me tell you about Camilla. So uh, <laughs> first the first season, um, we were like, we, you know, we were, we had a few key nuns. We had uh, Beatrice and we had Shaka Mary and we had um, Ava and Mother Superior. But we were like, we need more nuns. And I was like, we need a nun to kill. Uh, you know, we need <laughs> we need to have somebody. Be, we need to lose somebody. So we came up with this like enthusiastic rookie, Camilla, and she was supposed to die. Uh, you know, it's like we all get attached to her. I would have never and, forgiven you. <laughs> I know, right? Well, then we started writing Camilla. This is even before. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Tell me her name again. Olivia. Sorry. Um, this was before Olivia was even cast. We fell so in love with uh, with Camilla's character that we just couldn't do it. We were like, it was supposed <laughs> each episode. It was like, is this when she's going to die? And then. Mm -mm, well, you know, we don't want to do that. And then, <laughs> and then, and then Olivia Declan came in and just, or Delcan just came in and just crushed it. It was so adorable. And then, you know, and then we give her some hot guy that she's, that she's into. And again, it's just, it's just, it's just a young girl who sees a hot guy and, but she's constrained by the Catholic church. And, you know, that's how, uh, that's how she came together. No, literally, um, Dude, you know, dude, I'm a nun. <laughs> yeah, oh, like, the best perfect, line. <laughs> literally the best line. Um, I want that on a t-shirt. Right. Uh, but Camilla reminds me so much of my best friend. And if you guys had killed her off, I would literally have been devastated. <laughs> well, <laughs> we we felt the same way in, in not too long a time, but that, that was the original <laughs> intention. All right. So for our next question, um, do you have any advice for aspiring writers out there? And what do you usually do to help with burnout? <laughs> um, look, as far as aspiring writers go, it's, it's difficult. It's very difficult to, uh, to break into the business. I was given an opportunity to write the first X-Men movie out of nowhere. Like I literally, that was my first writing job was X-Men 1. So uh, I fell ass backwards into the business and or into being a screenwriter anyway. Uh, and 
Um, so I, I don't really know how to break in. I mean, oh, the only way I know how to break in is you you come in, you you spend your time with really talented people, people who are uh, clearly going places in the industry and try to be of use to them. And, and uh, maybe someday somebody gives you the opportunity of a lifetime. Um, beyond that, it's I have no idea. It's uh, that was not even a path I was pursuing. Um, burnout is a good question. Uh, burnout. I um, I grew up. I went to high school in Japan. Uh, spent a lot of time growing up in Asia, and uh, uh, so I have a sort of a Buddhist um, uh, perspective on burnout. So pretty much every night i'll just take 10 minutes 20 minutes and just clear my brain lose all thoughts let go of all problems and people don't want to do that because they feel like if i stop thinking about it i'll never solve it and yet the opposite is true you stop thinking about it and then your subconscious figures it out for you you know you, you let it go breathe it all out go to sleep forget your problems forget whatever story problems you're working on and in the morning, you'll be amazed at the solutions you come up with because you've taken that pressure off your brain. So that's how I deal with burnout. Really good advice. I am. Um... It's good advice for life too. I mean, yeah, no, exactly. the thing, the things, the thing that's in the back of your head that you can't stop it eating at you. You need to let it go. Uh, I mean, and not forever. Not not that it'll go away, but just. For a moment, just quiet the voice in your head and say, enough, and breathe. And that is hugely important in, in life and creativity. Well, that's a very excellent advice. Um, something I think I need to remember more often. <laughs> yeah, it's not easy to remember. Um, but trust me, it, it really works. I just wanted to, I know we this was like scheduled for 30 minutes, so I just want to check in time-wise. That's fine. No, can keep going. Are you sure? As long as, as long as people are willing to listen to me blather, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> Is to everyone go. good to keep going? I'm assuming. Laura. I'm good. If you're yeah. good, I'm good. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, okay. One question in terms of like warrior nun continuing, just like if it were to continue, what is one thing that you would want to see that you would want, whether it's a character development, a storyline or um, something? To continue, uh, I want to be careful about this because I don't want to tip the things that we would really like to do for a season mm -hmm. three should a miracle occur and miracles are our business. Um, but one thing I really wanted to do, because I got very close with William Miller, who played Adriel, and mm. just, you know, it's a lovely, sweet guy for all of his angelic, demonic, you know, behavior. Um, I really wanted to bring him back for season three as a, a head on a plate, like John the Baptist, um, <laughs> ex except still alive because he can't be killed. And basically, you know, we have a whole thing with Rhea going on. And the whole time there's his head on the plate. And Adriel's telling them, I told you, I told, I tried <laughs> to tell you, no, you didn't want me to run the whole thing. So now I'm ahead on a plate and this is what you want. So this is what you got. And then, and he would be like an advisor to them along the way. I thought that would be pretty. Oh, awesome. that would be funny. Oh my God. I can just picture William doing that. Too. I know. Like right? literally, as you said it, I was like, that would be perfect for William. It's so funny uh, because he's so... He's so grand and, you know, and arrogant and everything is Adriel. But then to be cut down like that, he would be hilarious, I think. Yeah. He's actually <laughs> such a nice guy. I um, had the privilege of doing a Twitter space with him um, a few months ago. And it's so funny because in all of the shows I've watched, not in all of them, but in two of the shows that I've been emotionally attached to, he's played a villain. Right. And so <laughs> it's so funny to like, you know, contradict that with how nice he is in real life. <laughs> he, re he really is. He's such a sweet guy and speaks, you know, fluent Spanish, fluent English. I mean, he's just a just a lovely, smart guy. Yeah, this build T on Netflix and eh, Netflix. <laughs> um, OK, so next question that I have is um, what was your favorite 
episode to work on, whether it was writing or producing, um, and why was that your favorite? Hmm. Season one, uh, I I got to, sp- I mean, I had a hand in in all of it, but I had I specifically got to write episode four, and I was like, I'm going to bring the fire on this, and I'm going to. I'm going to bring out Beatrice like nobody's business. I want her alone fighting as many guys as we can possibly find. Uh, and I wrote that sequence um, where she takes out all the guys and with her, I created the chainmail veil and, you know, um, just that whole thing. I was like, I'm going to use my X-Men powers and create like this <laughs> awesome badass thing. So I was very, very proud of that. Um and then season Act. two, I feel like all of season two, uh, I, I had a lot more uh, sort of influence on season two. Um, and I was like, I was like, OK, this season, all killer, no filler. Uh, we are going to hit the ground kicking ass. And it was so much bigger than we could possibly afford the whole the whole season, particularly the last uh, episode six of season two and episode eight of season two are are like feature films on such a tight budget. And I kept figuring, they'll tell me, David, we can't do it. You got to cut all this. And then Simon Barry was like, nope, we're going to try to do it all. And uh, and we did. So, um, but I guess, I don't know, season, I got to personal, I think I personally wrote episode six of season two uh which was the plan to take out adriel and it just and it's this huge plan and everything goes wrong um and uh and i'm very proud of that it's just such a disaster of an episode uh who wrote hoping against hope i don't recall um uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I I, I don't remember. I think that might have been a Simon Barry episode, but I'm not sure. I mean, look at the look at the credits on whatever episode that is. Um, but uh, I'm not sure. But the point is, a lot of the dialogue is taken from uh, elements of of Catholic religion, you know, or or just religion in general. You know, faith is my business uh miracles hoping against hope you know all of those things everything everything character wise is, is just sort of fed through this um this prism of uh of religious belief you know okay god forgive you for you know exactly what you do i wrote that yeah <laughs> i remember that thank you coco cat you're the best <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to look at the chat because I know we asked if people did have questions. Um, yeah, I'm like looking through. Oh, was there a discussion about Vincent's journey of faith and how Ava was in many ways his his savior at the end, freeing him from Adriel's cult by melting out the divinium? Um, well, I don't know if there was a specific discussion about it, but Ava is Ava is is the catalyst. She's the one who comes into the church comes into their lives and she's the one who changes everything so you know it's sort of the nature of her character if someone if somebody's going to be his savior it makes most sense that it's going to be ava you know and it's kind of cool that the the nuns can't forgive him but but ava eventually goes ah eh, whatever if you're on our side you're now you're on our side some um sh asked was father vincent yeah. always going to betray the ocs from the first drafts of the show and were you worried about how his redemption would play seeing as the terrible things him doing so caused but i'm gonna get so much trouble for this <laughs> uh we um no it was not the plan for vincent to be plan was for Doretti to be the bad guy and which, which is what's good. yeah it's what's set up it's it, it's it's clearly where it's going and then we were getting towards the end and a lightning bolt hit me in the head. And I said, what if Adriel comes out and 
he's free at last. It's this terrifying moment. And Vincent steps up to him and then kneels and says, my Lord, like this. Oh, my God. But let me tell you, that was probably, I mean, it wasn't, I had come to the show and I had already fallen in love with it. But Mm -hmm. that plot twist is what made me sign on to season two, because I was discussing this with Hillary earlier, but I had trusted Vincent from the start because Mary trusted him. Right. And like, I usually and he's so like, lovely, the actor. You exactly. Know, and I'm so I'm going to be honest. I especially in fiction, like I have a hard time trusting men, you know, because as a female presenting person, uh, of course, sure. Of, yeah. And like, and men suck. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, not all men, but like not yeah, all men, but in general. But... Um, and so anytime there's a male on screen who's even remotely suspicious, I'm like, all right, I I don't trust you. And so I didn't want to trust Vincent. But the fact that Mary trusts him throughout the entire season and I trusted Mary, I was like, all right, this dude's good. He's not going to betray me. He's not going to like, he's fine. It's Doretti that I need to focus on. And then that plot twist literally made me feel like the floor had dropped from under me because I was like, no, like I literally was like screaming at my TV. So props to you that was so well done i usually see plot to us coming a mile away and i didn't see that one coming so yeah well you know why because all of the writing leading up to it yeah. none of us knew <laughs> we, didn't write, we didn't write it that way and then and then they were like and then they we had a discussion in the writer's room oh, well we'll have to go back and set that up and i was like don't set it up just do it the way it's been done mm-hmm. like they will never see this coming and uh yeah so that's that's how that happened I and I looked. Like, I got. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say. Yeah, like, Tristan. Tristan had no idea until filming episode seven. Yeah, <laughs> nobody did. And then, and then, yeah. But Simon's gonna get mad at me that I said I thought of it, but I did think of it. So whatever. <laughs> um. No, I think that you guys. I really like how you played into it in season two as well, because it wasn't like you you did this gigantic plot twist and then you ignored it. You had him no, go through this entire that. like redemption arc, and he's still not even entirely redeemed by the end of season two. No, not at all. I mean, yes, yeah, somewhat he is, but but yeah. but no. Uh, well, you know why? Because what I love about the the Father Vincent thing, and and um and also um, I'm sorry, this is my show. I f- forget these people's names. Uh, the the um. The priest that worked with Doretti, who turned out to be the bad guy, uh, oh uh, with the gray hair and William, William, William. Thank you. Um, so the argument that William and Father Vincent make is all my life I've been looking for God, like a an, a real living representation. And here's this guy who can do godlike things so why wouldn't i follow him you know and it's just but just because somebody can you know as ava says just because someone can do miracles it doesn't make them god it just makes them a man you know or it just makes might make them another man or whatever that line is uh you can't just follow people because they have power and that's all problem with religion itself it's like we got to have some power you know that that we bow down to or whatever and it's so hypnotizing for them makes people do bad things make bad decisions and so you unholy bitch yeah <laughs> <laughs> um that was In a great his voice, i heard a thousand sermons yeah oh someone asked um <laughs> what did adriel whisper in father ensign's ear <laughs> yeah we never did figure out like if we're allowed we, to know that <laughs> we don't know we don't we know, don't know. Okay. um i think i think simon told uh adriel to whisper something in his ear that we wouldn't know and then we thought it would be hilarious if in the next season vincent says do you remember what you said to me you know because it's like he starts to cry right do you remember what you said to me at the at the thing and adriel's like no what did i say and that's when vincent realizes oh it was all bullshit like yeah he was just playing me the whole he doesn't even remember he said some life changing, religion changing thing, and uh, and we don't we don't know what it is, but it doesn't matter because it was going a back, lie. <clears throat> going back to what you said about one of Ava's lines about like just because someone has power doesn't mean that you should all follow them. 
Mm -hmm. It reminded me of that parallel where she's, I think it's that same scene um, where she's talking to Vincent and she sees a painting of herself because the people have declared her this like angel, this benevolent being. And she has literally always just viewed herself as Ava. Um, And so I just think that's a fascinating parallel. I'm I'm sorry, say that again. I was typing a thing. Oh, no, you're fine. I was just saying how going back to what you said about that line that Ava has about just because someone has power doesn't mean you have to follow them. Um, And then Mm -hmm. juxtapositioning that with that image of her, the painting of her as an angel Mm -hmm. that these people have made because they see her as this benevolent figure. Um, And she's only ever seen herself as just Ava. Um, And so I just think that's such a fascinating parallel. No. Uh, well, I appreciate that. And then, yeah, so um, Coco Cat was talking about the faith component um, yeah. and how we, dealt with that. Catholic, <laughs> yeah, how we dealt with the Catholic Church. So for myself, I don't buy into religion at all. I think it is it's is often used for terrible purposes or whatever. However, when we were doing this show, all of our heroes, uh, with the exception of Ava, are committed to the Catholic Church. So the goal was, we're not judging them. We're not judging anybody, um, and we're not we're not even judging the church. And that's why everybody, almost everybody, has a chance to illustrate why they're committed to the church. So they saved Mary's life. They brought her in. Um, uh, Camilla did it for service. Uh, Beatrice did it for fear or for or to cover who she was. And um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with having a belief that there's something more to this life. Um, you know, if I was to, so, so anyway, we just really uh, wanted to be very careful that we weren't like that people who are religious or, or people who are Catholic or what have you wouldn't feel put off by it. Still, I thought the Catholic church would tear us to pieces. I thought they'd just call us blasphemous and so on and so forth. And um, when did I decide to pry the Pope? Uh, I can't remember. I, well, I'll get into that in a second. Um, fact is, nuns love the show. Catholic Church didn't say a word. And the only thing, I put one joke into episode four of season one, saying uh, where May Lifshitz says, uh, Chanel says, um, she's it's hotter out here than a priest at a Boy Scout jamboree. And somebody called that just unbelievably tasteless and blasphemous and i was like finally <laughs> finally somebody got upset oh that's what you guys consider blasphemous right 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 um but yeah but we didn't want you know we didn't it's not this is not a show that's intended to make anybody feel bad it's intended to make people feel powerful and 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 you know feel the adventure of it and the love of it so uh so that's how we that's we how we handle those things mm. What is the most unhinged onset funny moment that happened that you remember? Oh God. Um, well, I don't know. I'll have to come back to that. I, I, I'm not sure. Oh yeah. So your Catholic relatives did not like the fried Duretti. <laughs> oh, uh, the point was Duretti and Adriel could not, the world was not big enough for the two of them and Duretti had to go. And, uh, um, and we also thought it would be very powerful if it looked like he was just hit by a bolt of lightning, you know, and made it look like God had turned on him when it really is just Adriel using tricks, you know. Are the nuns fighting with you on Twitter? Oh, I haven't seen any negative nuns, but maybe they're out there. I, don't know. <laughs> I think though that's the thing about the show, right, is that it's like it's exploring religion, sexuality, all of oh, that good. Yeah, as, the, as the story, um, you know, develops. Like it's not like you kind of were saying, Ash, earlier, it's not, um, you know, like I'm gay and that's all there is about my story. And the same with the religious aspect, like they're intertwined and they're complex throughout. And, and the science even, aspect as well, too. Yeah. And the science versus religion and like all of that, like we see it's done very well and you get all of those aspects. Whether... And all of the characters, like literally there isn't a single character on the show <clears throat> that isn't, that is like one dimensional. I think that 
someone I, so I absolutely hated Duretti in season one. Of course. And then season two, you actually almost, almost, he did not quite, I, I never did end up fully supporting him, but you almost end up empathizing with him because here is this man who has been thrown into a world where he suddenly has to question everything he's ever known and taught about and like lived his life for. Um, and so even Duretti, as problematic and corrupt and unlikable that he is, he's not just one dimensional, like he has depth to him. Um, and I think that's also something that <clears throat> added another layer of like, you guys explored the humanity aspect, even in someone like Adriel, who is, by all means is not human. Mm -hmm. um, it makes you wonder, like I have spent hours wondering what Rhea's motive. I know you can't really share because, you know, that's a season three uh, right. plotline, but it makes me wonder the complexities and motivations that Rhea has, because as an audience, we don't know whether she's trustworthy, likable, or good or bad per se, but she's got to be compelling because every other character is so. Mm. Yes. Well, she certainly would be, uh, should we be lucky enough to uh, continue the story? Um, uh, yeah, there's, there's big plans for, <laughs> there's big plans for Rhea. Um, uh, that wasn't really a question. So I'm going to say a thing. I, I figured out a funny thing that, that came up. So, um, uh, Joachim de Alameda, who played Duretti, um, was, you know, he's got all these incredibly complex Pope outfits and so on and so forth. And he, I think it was him who said, I think he said to Simon, I, I, I want a scene where I'm just in casual wear. And so we, we were like, what is a, what is, what does the Pope wear when he's not Poping? And, uh, and so, uh, Christina, our, our incredible costume designer, created this this sort of like leisure suit that he wears in this weird little white hat. <laughs> and I just think that's hilarious. Seeing seeing Doretti in his in his uh, his Pope uh, jogging outfit um, really cracks me up. When he's not poping. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we never, we never had a discussion about Mother Spirian and Father Vincent having a full fight scene where they're just kicking ass. Um, that would be good to have. I think that's a good. That would be a good season three idea. Um, they've they've always been sort of on the opposite sides of each other. I don't know if you mean fighting each other or fighting with each other, but I'd kind of love to see them fighting with each other at this point because she has you know shattered his leg and um, they've they've had some clashes already. How sentient is the halo? Mm, how oh. sentient indeed. <laughs> uh, we don't know. We don't know. You know, people talk about, you know, Vincent talks about, I, I feel now that the Ava, uh, that the halo chose Ava, but that's such a thing that a religious person would say, you know, reading meaning into something that might not have any meaning. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I just don't know how sentient it is. Franklin. Oh, love to hear more about the mother superior and Ava relationship and how that evolved. Well, you know, of course it started out the way it normally would, which, which is a hardcore Catholic nun meeting a libertine, uh, 19 year old wild child that she has to, that she has to work with. And of course, so she starts out super strict, but, um, uh, but, you know, Mother Superior um, is uh, sorry. Um, she's uh, Sylvia uh, Defanti is is such a lovely actress, and so I mean, amazing actress, such a lovely person, and really, what we what we loved about her journey was, especially when she dies. And comes back, you can see the difference on her face. You can see the things that she's let go of, and how happy she is, and and um, and uh, 
how much brighter she is. And so the idea was, again, Ava is a catalyst for change. She comes in and she takes this hard ass woman and finds her heart and softens her up. And that's how that came together. Yes, I would love to see Vincent and um, uh, Mother Superior fighting together because she is by Jesus. Um, episode four, when Vincent says to Camilla, sorry, I'm just reading the things at the moment because there's a lot of good questions. Um, Adriel is everywhere and Camilla touches her neck. I believe that's probably Olivia who improvised that. All right, I have one last question before yeah. we finish up. Who is your favorite sister warrior and why? If you had to pick just one. Well, I love them all, but Beatrice is the one. She's the one. She Beatrice is the she's the perfect warrior. She's perfect. She's perfect in every way. And that is sort of killing her because she doesn't think she's perfect and she feels like she's got this flaw, which is, of course, what Ava's there to prove is not a flaw, you know. Um, but there's something that you have to love about somebody who is amazing at everything they do and uh, and yet still has so much pain and so much difficulty accepting herself. It's just... And then when Christina, you know, brought it to life, it just... Yeah, you know, it just sang. It was amazing. So that's my favorite. Who's your favorite, Ash? Oh, that's a tough question. Well, you ask me. <laughs> um, I mean, probably Beatrice, but only because I feel like, again, I saw a lot of parallels between my own self um, and Beatrice, but also I saw a lot of Lexa and Beatrice. And I love that Beatrice was also her own character too. Um, I feel like she was, and I mean, Christina did an incredible job portraying her that it did make it seem, it was honestly the best representation I've ever seen of someone like me. Oh, um, that's lovely. So yeah, probably Beatrice, but Mary is a very, very like almost tied. Mary has got to be yeah. up there. Yeah, Mary. Well, Mary is the Wolverine character. You know, I always say that because I started with X-Men, but there's always a Wolverine character. There's always, you know, Rorschach or, or you know, there's always somebody who's just a badass who doesn't follow the rules and who doesn't love that as well. So, yeah, that was a great character. It's funny because X-Men was probably one of my earliest, like, Jean Grey was one of my favorite characters growing up and a big inspiration. Um and I grew up watching the original X-Men films. So that's so funny. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm <laughs> glad. And uh, yeah, well, like I say, I mean, I was I was a younger person. I was uh, when we were writing the X-Men movies, I was um, I was thinking about bigotry and racism and all that stuff. But, you know, our director was gay and and he really wanted to make it a gay metaphor. And, and we sort of, you know, worked all that in but mostly in X-Men, too. And. Yeah, and we got we got so much support from from young people who felt accepted and uh, and um, again, that's my that is my primary mission in writing, creating anything is to make people feel okay in their own skins and f screw the people who are trying to put you down. You know, it's just I, there's nothing I hate worse. So. Uh, so you should all feel excellent about yourselves because what you are is beautiful. <laughs> and I mean that. Thank you. Yes. We wanted to um, turn on the cameras now for anybody that wants to, just to mm -hmm. show our love, just wave, appreciate Please. all the time that you've taken with us tonight. It's been oh. amazing. Of course, I'm going to get in so much trouble for this. <laughs> only if you but I don't care. I don't care. Caught. I love my nuns and I love all of you. So you, know. you only get in trouble if you get caught. So it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, a big heart. Big heart to you guys. So there's, let's see, there's over almost 60 people in here. So. And even more on Twitter expecting to watch it when the recording comes out. 
So right. well, that's Twitter's that's gone a little crazy at, at your interview. <laughs> I so you might get caught. <laughs> that's all right. I'll put it out on my Twitter. I've got uh, <laughs> 212,000 followers. We'll, we'll get it out there. Look, the, yeah. the main thing for me, I don't care if I get in trouble. The main thing for me is um, I love the fight to, to, to continue the show. The show deserves at least four seasons. Um, I have to say I, I'm not optimistic uh, just because I know because because Netflix has never let a show go before or repicked it up. But I'm so moved by the fight and I think it's worthwhile. So I want to I want to keep hammering away at that. Uh, would I do an OCS interview at another date? Of course. Yeah. Take in everything I've said and think about what you want to ask. And I'm always I would always love to talk about Warrior Nun. I, I think this this might be my first interview I've ever done about it. So. Oh, wow. That's incredible. Thank you so much for joining us. This is, I'm still trying to process everything you've shared. No, I've been, yeah. I'm like, so thank, you so thank you so much. Thank you so much for the story. Quite and thank you for your time. We truly quite, we, you're quite welcome. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your love. And, and thank you for wanting your nuns back. Uh, uh, it's just there's nothing I don't love about this whole show and fandom and all of that. So stay strong. Don't let anybody give you any shit and uh, and keep kicking ass. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. All right. I'll talk to you later. Bye bye. Okay, have a good night. Bye. Bye.